extra dimensions. Um, <coughs> so this is chapter seven. So we'll, uh, we will leave supersymmetry for a couple of days and then just concentrate on another extension of um, of the space-time symmetries in four dimensions. Remember that in the first lecture I, I told you that uh, we're using symmetries as, as a basic tool to, to go beyond the standard model. Uh, then we, <coughs> a natural way to, do, to go is to extend the symmetries we, we know. And there are two types of symmetries, the internal symmetries and the space-time symmetries. Internal symmetries bring us to grand unified theories and so on. And the space-time symmetries were of two times. Uh, the space-time symmetry were of two types. One was supersymmetry that we have been discussing so far. And, uh, and the other is uh, probably more obvious, and of course it was proposed earlier, is just to to extend the number of dimensions of a space-time, so then we have uh, more space-time symmetry. So this is the uh, extra dimensions. Notice that in a, in a way, supersymmetry, what we're doing is just adding also extra fermionic dimensions. Whereas these are extra bosonic directions in the sense that uh, this we extend the space time to super space, but here we are just extending in the natural way just to have real physical dimensions as we observe uh, now in three plus one. Okay, so this is uh, this is uh, the topic that I will start discussing now, and. Uh, uh, <coughs> Let me start with a little bit of history. Probably you have heard most of it, but uh, for completeness. Uh, of course, uh, discussing extra dimensions uh, in mathematics, that was uh, not very hard to think when people were talking about uh, Riemannian geometries and so on. You can just talk, take a, talk about uh, manifolds of any number of dimensions. Uh, but uh, in the context of, uh, of uh, physics, and to think about uh, the idea of unification, this started in 1914, the work of uh, Nordstrom, and then independently 1919 and 21 by Caruzza. I think the original paper was 1919, uh, but it wasn't published until several years later. And uh, they wanted to unify gravity with electromagnetism. No idea didn't work because uh, it was just before Einstein's uh, general relativity, so he wanted to unify them in another fashion, just everything in terms of a vector field or so in, in five dimensions, so having the, the metric. So that didn't work. <coughs> uh, whereas Kaluza just was right after Einstein, and he said, well, let's just take Einstein's theory in four dimensions and add a fifth point. I have to give credit here that uh, Caduceus' work was very much base, based on ideas of uh, vial, that uh, these ideas that at the end uh, introduced the gauge principle and so on in, in, uh, in our days, although vial was doing it from another perspective. <laughs> but that motivated very much the work of uh, Caduceus. <clears throat> and then, of course, in 1926, Klein took the idea of Kaluza probably more seriously. And uh, the, the, the difference between Kaluza and Klein is that uh, Kaluza just said, well, let's assume there is an extra dimension, but nothing depends on it. So you don't see the physical d dimension. Whereas Klein said, well, this physical dimension is there, but it's very tiny. It's a circle, for instance. So the, the, so, well, this, all this is in the, in the, the ideas of this was unify gravity and, uh, and electromagnetism. And Klein now came up with the idea that the universe is like a cylinder.
with the radius of this extra. This is a, this is the our uh, three plus one dimensional universe, and this is a small universe of radius r, very small. So this is the, the fifth dimension, and r very small. So that you couldn't see. So that is uh, what uh, uh, Klein's contribution essentially was. And uh, <clears throat> after that, many people work on it. This is on and off. You can see Einstein's interest on in this uh, uh, came several times in his uh, in his career, and also people like uh, Jordan, Pauli, etc. So. Ehrenfest, I think he was interested in this, and so on. But uh, essentially, not that much uh, progress as, uh, as uh, in the way that we regard it was uh, made until the 1960s. Again, 1960s. And, uh, and here, well, the several things happened. One is that uh, is there is an, an, a very nice historical uh, anecdote. Is that uh, in a, in a series in a course that uh, Bryce DeWitt gave in Les Uges, 1964, he put uh, that as an exercise, as, you know, like an example sheet we distribute for you, to generalize this uh, idea of the fifth dimension to any number of dimensions. It's just uh, just an exercise for the student, which is very nice. <laughs> So I have to give the credit to Bryce. But uh, of course, this idea of extra dimensions, I think pa Pauli had already thought about extra, uh, enhancing the, the number of dimensions, but Bryce, Bryce I think, is uh, very general. And, uh, but of course, the, the And uh, <coughs> then, then the strings. And people proved that the strings had to be equal to 26 in the Poisonic strings. So that was in the 60s. And then 70s and 80s, there was a lot of work on this precisely because of supersymmetry. Actually, supergravity. People realized something we, we didn't spend that much time discussing supergravity. People realized uh, during those days that you wanted to build supergravity theories of extended supersymmetry, so with a supersymmetry n greater than 1, then it was easier to construct them by going to higher dimensions. And for if the famous n equals to 8 supergravity that I told you was the maximum supergravity you can get, it was easier to get if you start from a theory in 11 dimensions. And uh, actually, <coughs> in here, 11 dimensions play a special role. It was proved that it was a maximum for supersymmetry. This is the work of uh, NAM, if I remember correctly. So the maximum number of, uh, of supersymmetries uh, is, uh, implies that the dimension was the equals to 11 was the maximum number. And, uh, <clears throat> but it was also argued in a very elegant way by Witten. that it was a minimum number of dimensions. And the, minimum, the idea of the minimum was as follows. Look at this, uh, this circle that we have here has a symmetry. And the symmetry is just uh, uh, shifts around the circular dimension, just uh, the angular variables. And the, that, that symmetry 
it's a it's a U1 symmetry. It's just a it's, a, it's, a, it's a angular rotation. It's a U1 symmetry, and that's precisely the origin of getting electromagnetism out of the fifth dimension. So electromagnetism is comes because of the symmetry of the extra dimension. This is just a, a that was the elegant way of, of of unifying gravity and electromagnetism at that time. And uh, <coughs> of course, you didn't have to go beyond one because at this time, these were the only interactions that people knew. So they already have a uni unified theory of all interactions because you have gravity and electromagnetism. That was that was everything you had at that time. They didn't know the, the nuclear forces as strong and weak interactions. However, when you want to go to to try to say, oh, can I have the symmetries of the SU three cross two cross one coming out of the symmetries of an extra uh, dimensional manifold? So then you have to go to a higher dimensional object, and uh, for instance, that's what uh, people consider here to go to beyond five. And then we can ask the question, well, what is, if I consider this uh, manifold, this extra dimensional manifold, to be a coset space, G over H, and I wanted to have the symmetries of the standard model, which is SU3 cross S2 cross U1, what is the, the smallest dimension that will have that symmetry? Of course, the higher dimension you have, of course you will have that symmetry. So he asked the question, what is the smaller manifold of, a, a, of which is a coset that has the symmetries of SU3 cross S2 cross U1? And that's, uh, that manifold was, um, so we then took the G over H to be a SU3 crosses 2 crosses U1 divided by maximum subgroup, which is a SU2 cross U1 cross U1. And then you count the dimensionality of this space. This space will have the symmetries of, uh, of the standard model, SU3 cross 2 cross U1. And you count the dimensionality. So this dimensionality of G over H. Yes, it's, it's a, you, have to, you have to say, uh, you, you want to have a manifold that has these symmetries. Then you can model it out by a subgroup. So you model it out by the maximal possible subgroup to get the smallest number of dimensions. Number. Exactly. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. And uh, so the dimensionality of G over H is equal to the dimensionality of SU3 is 8. If SU2 is 3, of U1 is 1. Minus the dimensionality of SU2 is uh, 3 minus 1 minus 1. And that is 7. If I didn't make a mistake. So, <coughs> so that means that. Uh, uh, the full dimensionality of space-time will be 7 plus 4, that's 11. It's a beautiful thing. So he came with this beautiful argument in favor of 11, which is a, it was kind of a, a very nice and attracted some attention. However, at the same time, uh, f a few a year later or so, Witten again came back with a, with a kidding thing for 11 dimensions. So he said, well, so well, the standard model is chiral. We know the standard model is chiral. We have been claiming that very often. And we then say, well, if you start with any uh, model in odd number of dimensions, you cannot get anything chiral. And 11 is odd, so then you couldn't get chiral. Okay. So, so this will be well, <laughs> Sorry? Should that be? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. OK. <clears throat> so then the equal 11 minimum. Uh, but, but he came also with the idea that uh, the equal 11 is non-chiral. And non-chiral, the easy word to see is that there is isn't. No, the in 11 dimensions you will see, we will see later is no equi no analog of uh, gamma phi. Okay, so gamma phi, remember in, in four dimensions that defines the chirality. In 11 in all, in all dimensions there is no analog of that that matrix, so then you don't have chirality. I think it's it's hard to see when you come down to four dimensions that you generate chirality out of your compactifications, and that actually. So that killed 11 dimensions. And uh, 
But that was very good because in the meantime, a few people like uh, Michael Green here and others were studying string theory. And string theory was not in all dimensions, it was in 10 dimensions. And that's then I think we didn't say, well, that's, that's the way to go. And everybody went there. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so, so then, so the gravity is equal to 11 and then super strings. The nice thing about that is it's chiral, but also super strings have the big advantage that they are actually a candidate to solve the most important problem we have mentioned, which is the quantization of gravity. So that was the main, that should have been the main motivation to everybody to go to strings, uh, super string theory. But it took some time for people to, to actually uh, move to in that direction, except for a few brave ones. And then, of course, 1990s. I counted it once, I'm not, I'm not completely sure, but it's precisely 11 years after he killed 11 dimensions. Mm -hmm. Witten came back, came, revived V equal to 11. <laughs> okay, and that's now it's called N theory. And of course, that is essentially seen as part of the whole picture of a string theory. It's not just a, a new theory or so, but it's just a, it's something that generalizes uh, the string theories that we know that there are different limits of one single theory. And one of the limits has an 11 dimensional supergravity manifestation. And of course, the other thing that came up in the 1990s is uh, the idea of brains, and especially the brain world scenario. And this was uh, very important because this allowed for the possibility of having very large extra dimensions. So large that eventually may, it may even be shown in the, in the in LEC in a couple of years' time. So that, that, that uh, probably is not the case, but uh, in principle, it is possible to do it. And the reason to do it is because we have this brain world. The idea of the brain world is that we will have, well, our universe will be a surface inside a high, higher dimensional space. And that's nice because it, in, precisely from a string theory, there's a natural objects, the, the deep brains that many of you have seen, are precisely have that property. And we can be living on a deep brain. Our whole universe can be just a deep brain. And, uh, and that will have, uh, that because of that, I will see, I will see in the next few days, why that thing implies that you can have very large extra dimensions at the level of being experimentally tested. So that's a very exciting thing. And of course, so that's, a, that's how we stand so far. OK, so let me start. <coughs> let me start with the. Sorry. Yes. We have not extended such extra dimensions. Yes, there are extra dimensions. But yes, and that's very good. So we separate the world into uh, the separate the, the extra dimensions in two sides. So we have a 10-dimensional world. So we are living in 10 dimensions. And six of the dimensions are small, so we don't see, for instance. But they are small, not as small as people thought in the past. They had to be this size. People thought they had to be the Planck length, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Now they can be small, but uh, observable. Uh, so even to the limit of uh, 0.1 millimeter, for instance, you can have that. That's the that extreme case. But then our universe can be just a D brain. And if it is a D3 brain, a D3 brain has only three special dimensions. So we will be seeing only three special dimensions. And, and this special dimension, it will be living on, on an extra dimensional object. But we are trapped. It's like being trapped on a, on a wall. So you're trapped on the wall, and you cannot move out of it. <laughs> OK, so that's the thing. There is this extra dimension there, but you cannot go. Uh, so that, that's And of course, gravity will fill the extra dimensions. But, but uh, the quarks and leptons are trapped on the wall. Why can't they be extended? Why they cannot move to the extra dimensions? No, why these extra dimensions can be infinity? infinity. Oh. oh, that's what your question. Yes, there is the proposal. <laughs> and we, I will mention briefly uh, Randall and Sundrum that precisely you, can, you may have, uh, they have a particular model in five dimensions where the, the, the extra dimension can be as large as you want. Uh, yes. And, uh, it is not easy to get that. And I, I haven't seen it realized from, from any string theory construction. Personally, but in a toy model of five dimensions, Randall syndrome had it, which is very interesting, I would say. Well, in a string theory, it's special because gravity comes from uh, closed string modes. 
So, for instance, here we can, for instance, we can have this, this. This will be our universe. This will be a D brain, and uh, and then uh, the quarks and leptons are made out of strings, that, and the endpoints are attached to them. Whereas the graviton is a closed string, so the string doesn't have any any attachment to anybody. So it fills all the extra dimensions. So these are quarks and leptons. And this is the graviton, for instance. Yes. Even the uh, gauge is also here. So that, that, that makes a, a real difference between gravity and the rest. Of course, we can have extra brains. And extra brains can play the role of the hidden sector that I was talking to you uh, the, the, the previous day. That, uh, for instance, you can have this can be supersymmetric. You can break supersymmetry in, a f in, a, in another world, say. And then gravity is, is a perfect mediator to tell you that supersymmetry was broken. Okay. Okay. So that, that's, that's one of the pictures. OK. I was planning to tell you this later, but it's OK. Thank you for asking. <laughs> so <clears throat> very good. So let's, let's start. Let's start with the simplest case, and then we'll build up uh, start with the uh, five dimensions, and for 5D, I will start with a simplest case, which is a scalar field. Then I will move on to other fields. A scalar field. Then I will introduce gauge fields and so on, just to 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 build up the general picture. So let's consider just a scalar field in five dimensions. So we take we start with a, an action which will be the integral of d five x times d mu phi. Uh, I will call I will call d m phi d m phi star, where m equals zero, one, two, three. These are the standard. And then the four dimensional index. OK? So <clears throat> this is the simplest theory you can imagine in the five dimensions. You just, just have a, a fifth uh, coordinate to integrate over. So then the, the phi's depend on all the coordinates xn. So phi's are functions of xm, of course. And m goes from 0 to 4. So let's consider then that the, the fifth dimension, so x4, x4, and we will call it y. And that will be a, a circle. Okay, so essentially, y will be a, a, um, a theta angle times uh, the size of the circle. So that means that the space time will be equal to the four dimensional Minkowski <coughs> times the circle S1. <coughs> OK. Since it is a circle, that means that, that uh, the coordinate y is essentially a periodic coordinate. So you can go around several times. Mean, when you go around 2 pi, you get to the same thing. So since that means that, that, uh, um, so that we have periodicity in the y direction. So that means that, that uh, when you have a periodic function, it asks us to do something to it, and which is uh, to do a Fourier expansion. It's a natural thing. <coughs> so so 
So that means that I will write phi as a function of x mu. Now I'm writing the mu as the standard uh, four-dimensional coordinates, and then y as the extra coordinate. And this will be infinite sum from minus infinity to infinity <coughs> of some Fourier coefficients that I will call phi n. It's the same letter, but just I'm putting an index. And it will be times e to the to i theta, where theta is the angle, where I can write i n y over r, because y was the coordinate, so the angle is y over r, where r is the radius of the circle. And then, since I'm expanding on y, these x mu's are not part of the Fourier expansion, so that means that the Fourier coefficients should be a function of the x mu's. Okay. With r equals the radius of the circle. <clears throat> so that means that the periodicity here is y equals to y plus 2 pi times r. <clears throat> OK. So this is a very simple thing. We have a circle, so we have a, the Fourier expansion. <clears throat> now, Now, uh, we started with an action, and the action was uh, this is a free field in five dimensions. So we can look for the equations of motion corresponding to this field. And um, so <coughs> a field equation, that means that it is a free field, it has, it has no mass. So <clears throat> that means that it is just a simple dm, dm phi equal to 0. Okay, so that is, that is uh, straightforward. But now if we plug instead of phi, we write the whole infinite sum in terms of Fourier expansion. So that means that we will have the sum over n of the n dm, we have, we, we take first the values, n it goes through the mu values, so it will be d mu, d mu, and then they will be acting on the, on the Fourier modes, phi n. <clears throat> and then when n is y, so then we will have dy, dy, but dy, dy, will bring us a factor of i n r each times we, we take the derivative with respect to y. So we have a factor of minus n squared over r squared. And then times phi n, phi n. Times phi n. And everything, of course, will be multiplied in the phase over r. OK? And, uh, Are those indices mu's or m's? Yes. This is capital M, and this is a mu. This is an important question. Sorry? Is mu over mu? Zero, four, mu equals 0, 1, 2, and 3. And m, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. OK. Thank you. Yes. And of course, this will be equal to 0, because that's the right-hand side of this equation. OK. So what is it that we are left with? We are left with a, this single equation, in, which is trivial in, four, in five dimensions, becomes 
this equation in, in same four, but uh, <coughs> since uh, the exponentials are linearly independent, this implies that we have each term in the, uh, this factor has to be zero. And so then we will have, from one equation, we are left with an infinite number of equations in four dimensions. And this is very nice because, remember, we started with a massless field in five dimensions. Massless, to be emphasized. And then what happened now in four dimensions? We have an infinite number of equations. We have now an infinite number of fields in four dimensions because the phi n, each of them being a function of the x mu, is, 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 a, is a field. And so we have an infinite number of fields satisfying now a Klein-Gordon equation for a massless, massive field. Okay. So, so that's, that's, that's the big step in the Caruza. Um, so we have So this is the uh, Klein-Gordon equation for massive fields. And uh, an infinite number of them. <laughs> And uh, the mass with mass equals n over r. So that the mass will be a function of n. So for the field, the nth field, we has, will have a mass n divided by r. And these are called the, <coughs> for, for n equals to 0, it's still a mass, massless. And this is usually called the zero mode, for clear reasons. And uh, for n different from zero, these are called the Calusa Klein. Or momenta mode. Uh, yes, yes, thank you. Okay. So, what is it that we have learned from here? It's a very simple exercise, but we have learned that once we go to a, move to an extra, one extra dimension, one single field becomes an infinite number of fields, and, and they all uh, with different, and the masses are uh, split in a, in a natural way. So this is called the Calusa Klein Tower, because uh, you have a, a tower of masses. Oops, sorry. You have a tower of, of massive modes. have m equal to 0, and then one of r, 2 over r, and so on. Okay, so it's an infinite tower of, of states, and the ratio of the masses is always an integer, so it's a, it's a well-defined spectrum of, of, a, of states. Yes. Yes, but in this case, notice that, that uh, it's a complex field. 
So in that sense, it's, 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 it's a natural thing. If you had a, 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 you will have started with a real field. Then we have this constraint that the phi, so that the, the minus n mode and the n mode have to be uh, paired up to get to get the final result to be real. Okay. So this is a very simple exercise, but it gives us a lot of information. <coughs> and uh, okay, now we can still play a little bit with this, and uh, <coughs> we can plug the the expansion that we had here for the field phi. We can plug it into the action, <coughs> and uh, so. And you will see that, that, that then the action will be. <coughs> Let me call this action to be explicit, 5D. So then I have 5D. That will be the integral over D4x, integral over DY of. <coughs> the infinite sum over n d mu phi n d mu phi n star minus n square over r square phi n square and then this will give us the integral of dy will give us a 2 pi r what we can take outside the action it will be integral over d4x. And then we can start expanding here. The first term will be d mu phi 0, d mu phi 0 star. That doesn't have a mass, so that's OK. Plus the rest. Okay. And usually, so we can work, uh, if we work at low energies, we work at energies much, uh, much smaller than 1 over r. So all these massive fields will be too heavy, and they can decouple. So you can just uh, integrate them out, say, in, in your effective theory, and concentrate on the, on the physics for the massless mode, for the zero mode. So the zero mode will be the most important one, because that, that will be the one that is remaining at low energies. All the other ones will be heavy, and if, we, if, they're, if, if they're too heavy, we can just essentially um, integrate them out. And uh, this illustrates the difference between Kaluza and Klein. Uh, what, Klein what, what Kaluza had done was essentially to forget about all these extra fields. He didn't have them. He just uh, changed phi and phi not as if they were the same thing. So that was Kaluza. And because they say, well, let's start with the field phi and say that it does not depend on y. So when it does not depend on y is when you have n equals to 0. So that's, 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 the, the, and that, that's, that's what Kaluza was doing, essentially only keeping the 0 mode and forgetting about all the higher modes. Like what? Yes, they will be. Yeah, will be there. They will be there, but they will be massive. They will include all the massive modes, so they will be all. Um, oh yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes. Oof, that's true. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yes. So they they will be there, but they cancel. Yeah. And. Um, when you integrate, yeah, you're right. But in any way, at the end, you will, you will uh, the massive modes, in the first approximation, they you can just integrate them out and just keep only the massless mode. And uh, uh, so to make a, a, a difference between Kaluza and Klein, so if we keep, if uh, only the zero mode, 
this is what, as I told you, this is what Caluzza did. This is usually called, uh, this is, is, it is like, it, uh, it's like having the original phi of xm was just phi of x mu, and please make the difference between n and mu here. Here, no y. And this is what Kaluza did. So he didn't have to do any Fourier expansion or anything like that. And this is something that is usually called as dimensional reduction. So just that means that you add, you put fields in higher dimensions, but you set the fields to be independent of the extra dimensions at all. So that's that's a, that's Kaluza's way. Whereas Klein. Uh, and in this case, as I told you, dimensional reduction is equal to having the, the compactification on a circle and setting, keeping only the zero mode. And so if we have, in, in the general case, this is what is called uh, spontaneous compactification, or just compactification. And dimensional reduction, in this case, is just the limit when, uh, when you have the compactification and keep only the zero mode. And, but this happens only because the extra dimension is a circle. If the extra dimension will not have been a circle, uh, it's not uh, the same thing just, uh, just keeping the zero mode that will give you the dimensional reduction. So that's, that's something to keep in mind. And we will see more often. And the reason is that the circle is flat. So it's a, simple, it's very, it's a very simple case. <coughs> Okay, so uh, okay, so that's the difference between Kaluza Klein compactification and dimensional uh, reduction. And but as I told you, the the zero mode will always be the most important part because this is the thing that survives at low energies. So, so the compactification is when you do the expansion. Exactly. When you keep all the you keep all the all the all the extra modes, all the extra for uh, you keep you keep all the Kaluza Klein modes and say, well, they are suppressed, but they are there. Whereas in the other one, you just simply didn't have them. Very good. So that was the case of a scalar field. So now let's move on to the vector field. I have a few minutes. So massless vector. In 5D. <coughs> so this introduces some extra things. So now we have an A M function of X M. Again, where M equals 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. <coughs> so this splits into two. It will split. So remember that before I split the coordinate into x mu and y. Now I have to split also the the field itself into an a mu and a a four that I will call rho. Okay. Notice. The, 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 this, this, this thing. AM is a vector in five dimensions. AMU is a vector in four dimensions. Whereas A4 carries no four dimensional indices, so it's just scalar. Okay? <clears throat> And for each of them, for each of them, we can have the same thing. If, if, the, the, if uh, the fourth coordinate is, uh, is a circle, we can have a Fourier expansion for a mu and a Fourier expansion for rho. Okay. So, a 
for instance, uh, a mu will be an infinite sum of a mu n e to the i n y over r, and the same thing for all. Good. And uh, also, you start with a five dimensional action. You will start, I'm sorry, we'll start with the integral of d5x, 1 over g squared. And I will call this the five dimensional gauge coupling, fmn, fmn. With, uh, of course, FMN being the, the curl of, of A. Then we can do the same trick as we did for the scalar field. You can find the, the field equation. And the field equations would be essentially the Maxwell equation in five dimensions. Uh, that in terms of a's, I can write like dm, dm, a n minus dm, n, a m. And uh, <coughs> for this one, I can choose a gauge. I will finish in a couple of minutes. Choose a gauge, which is the trans transverse gauge. And remember that there is a gauge symmetry here for for the electromagnetic field. So the transverse gauge, I choose uh, dm am zero, and still there is a freedom that can be fixed by setting a zero to zero. Yes. Oh, that will come later. Yes. I'm just doing exercise physics in five dimensions. What can we do? Take a, field, a scalar field, and then what you get. Then take a vector field, then what you get. And then we will move to the Kaluza Klein idea of, of, of having, um, starting with gravity, and then see that everything emerges from gravity. Okay. That will not work anyway, so <laughs> don't, don't raise us full expectations. But anyway. <clears throat> okay, so we have that. And, and uh, um, then we plug this into the action, as, as I did for the scalar field. And what is it that you will get? You will get, sorry, I will take one more minute. So that, that will get uh, plug into the action. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, yes, if I choose this gauge, what I'm left with is that I, I'm left with, um, with an equation of dm, dm, a n equal to zero. So that's again the same trick as before. We have the kind of a Klein-Gordon equation for a massless subject, and the expansion will give us a lot of uh, massive objects, like in the scalar field. So, so this will then we have similar. To scalar, that implies the infinite tower of modes, of massive modes. So when we plug into the action, the the S5 
will lead us to an FS4D, which takes the form D4X, after iterating over Y, then it will be 2 pi R divided by 5D squared times F mu nu, F mu nu, plus 2 pi R D mu, and, so, and this F mu will be the zero mode, F mu nu, uh, zero, zero, the zero mode, plus D mu rho zero, D mu rho zero, plus the infinite tower of, uh, of modes. And again, the most relevant ones will be the, the zero mode part, so the, we keep that. But from here, we can see that we are, of course, we are getting, why is it we're getting a Maxwell theory in four dimensions plus a, full, a scalar in four dimensions, massless also, plus the full tower. But in four dimensions, now this coefficient here will be the one over g square in four dimensions, the, the gauge coupling in four dimensions. So, 1 over g square 4 dimensions, which is the coefficient of f mu nu, f mu nu, then equals to 2 pi r g square 5d. So that means that... The second term have not, not have that coefficient, two. This one? Yeah. Uh, I think you are right. I think you are right because it came out, yes. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. And, uh, but the important thing is this, something to keep in mind, and th let me tell you the, the, the important physical implication of this. Remember, the gauge coupling in four dimensions is uh, dimensionless. Okay, this is, the, the, the gauge coupling is dimensionless. Now we have the gauge coupling in five dimensions cannot be dimensionless because you have this R here. So this ratio has to be dimensionless. Dimensionless. Uh, so that means that, in, and that was, that's a fact actually, you go to extra dimensions, the corresponding gauge coupling is dimension full. And you have to, when you have dimension full couplings, you have to worry about being the theory non renormalizable and this kind of things. So in that sense, four dimensions is a critical theory for electromagnetism or for in general for gauge interactions. Four dimensions is a nice one where you can have the, the coupling to be dimensionless, and then you can talk about uh, normalization group running and everything very nicely. Okay, thank you. Sorry for taking your time. <laughs>